Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. There's a saying in industry that the rules and regulations are written in blood. If you've ever worked in a dangerous job, then you'll no doubt be familiar with that idea. There are some rules that ought to be common sense, some so obvious that it's baffling that they require spelling out, others that are too oddly specific to be anything other than a direct reaction to a singular incident. Incidents so horrific that entire industries worldwide take notes and change their approaches. This is one such event, the Byford Dolphin Diving Bell Incident. The Byford Dolphin was a semi-submersible drilling rig owned by the Norwegian company Dolphin Drilling. She had a capacity to have up to 102 people on board. It had engines that could move at a speed of up to 4.5 knots. It was towed from location to location by tugboats, drilling wells in various parts of the world. The Byford Dolphin was completed in 1974. In the intervening 40 plus years, she worked all over the North Sea before being scrapped in 2019. Now, I'm sure there are people who aren't familiar with the function that divers provide within an offshore drilling environment. Indeed, the only time the important roles that they play tend to get any mainstream press is when something goes catastrophically wrong. There's a reason why these divers are paid extraordinary amounts of money for the work that they do. They work long hours in the most inhospitable conditions imaginable and often in sub-optimal conditions where the very nature of the job actively wrecks their bodies piece by piece regardless of the precautions taken. Where possible work is carried out with remotely operated vehicles in order to minimise the risk to humans but often there's no substitute for the dexterity and feedback you get from a human on the site actively being there at the location. In 1983 there was a team of divers working on the Byford Dolphin. The Byford Dolphin had its own infrastructure to facilitate diving from the rig. This meant that a dive support vehicle wasn't required and in theory this saved a lot of cost and time. The setup was as follows. There was a diving bell that divers would go into in order to be lowered down below the surface. There they would carry out the work required. There were two separate decompression chambers that each housed a dive team. Between each chamber was a section of passageway known as trunking. The teams in question and their locations were as follows. There were two dive tenders who managed the operation of the equipment from the outside and were well versed in all aspects of diving. They were William Crammond and Martin Saunders. In decompression chamber two were two British divers, Edwin Arthur Coward and Roy P. Lucas. Coming back from a recent dive, and in the process of exiting the diving bell and heading for chamber one, were two Norwegian divers, Bjorn Bergesen and Trolls Hellevik. The chambers were kept at a pressure of nine atmospheres, as opposed to an ambient pressure of one atmosphere. This was in order to avoid having the divers spend a large amount of time decompressing between jobs. What should have happened is that once the diving bell was shut and sealed, the door from chamber one would be shut. This would leave both chambers and the diving bell fully isolated and safely remaining at pressure. The trunk would then be depressurized in order to allow the diving bell to be released. This procedure has been conducted safely hundreds if not thousands of times the world over. This time however, it went wrong and it went wrong in the worst way possible. One of the dive tenders outside opened the clamp which kept the trunk sealed whilst the door to the chamber was opened. Now what happens next probably sounds like nothing to the casual listener but apparently if you're informed this is true horror. Instantaneously the two chambers equalised. They went from their artificial pressure of nine atmospheres back to one atmosphere with a rush of air. The diving bell was forcibly ejected by the pressure change. 
It struck and killed William Crammond, one of the tenders that was outside. But the true horror is what went on inside the chambers. Unfortunately, one of the Norwegian divers, Truls Helvik, was standing at the door between the chambers and he was exposed to the highest pressure change with the least distance. His body was forced through the narrow opening and he suffered the following trauma. His abdominal cavity was entirely bisected. This essentially means that the upper portion of his torso was ripped in half by the sudden pressure change and all of his major internal organs were ripped out of his abdomen and chest. Three parts of his body were forcibly ejected through the small gap and they were found 10 meters above the location of the incident. That's 30 odd feet. His internal organs projected that distance in a millisecond. Needless to say, his death would have been instantaneous and he would likely have been completely unaware that anything was even wrong. Now, there are photos of his body online if you want to see the kind of damage that this did to him. Obviously, I'm not going to show it here. The other three divers suffered a different horrific fate as the rapid change in pressure caused the blood in their veins to boil. Now, the mechanism of what causes this effect is a little convoluted. It comes down to the pressure differential between the outside atmosphere and the working pressure that they were kept at. You've probably heard of the bends. If a diver comes up too quickly, there's a risk that the nitrogen in their bloodstream can form tiny bubbles. This is a painful and possibly deadly condition called the bends. It causes swelling in the extremities and extreme amounts of pain. What the three men experienced was almost like a turbocharged version of that. The huge pressure change inflicted on them meant that all of the nitrogen in their blood would have turned to bubbles in an instant. The existence of so many bubbles at once would have lowered the boiling point of their entire bloodstream to a point that it flashed off in a fraction of a second. Essentially, their entire cardiovascular system fried itself in milliseconds. Again, this probably happened so quickly that they most likely didn't realise that anything was happening until it was all over. A small mercy, perhaps. So, what went wrong that day? Well, the Bifid Dolphin was using outdated safety equipments. At the time, there were mechanical devices that would stop any of the chamber doors being opened if there was too much differential in pressure between them. The Bifid Dolphin had similar systems in place, but they relied on human interpretation and operation. In fact, the lack of interlocks and failsafe mechanisms on board the Bifid Dolphin had been noted and commented on by workers and regulatory bodies that had visited them prior to the incident. As I said at the beginning, rules and regulations are written in blood. The immediate result of this horrific accident was to tighten any safety loopholes. This meant that companies could no longer run these older and less safe systems as a cost-cutting measure. In the aftermath, a large amount of blame fell on the dive tender Crammond, who was described as having opened the clamp without appropriate confirmation that the chamber door was shut. Some reports from before the incident mention other factors that may have played a role. One report mentions the fact that the ceiling valves were over-rotated, leaving them with gaps when the indicator was in the closed position. One of the relatives of the victims accused the Norwegian government of covering up the cause of their father's death. It took a total of 26 years after the accident for the families of some of the victims to be compensated for the loss of their loved ones. The Bifid Dolphin continued to work after this incident and it drilled numerous new wells around the world. In 2019, after yet another downturn in the ever volatile oil and gas industry, the Bifid Dolphin was scrapped in Turkey. Since the diving bell incident, of course there have been other accidents, but nothing as terrible as this explosive decompression incident that killed five people.
And so that's pretty much where the tale of the Biford Dolphin ends. I've always been interested in these weird decompression stories. I remember hearing that urban legend about a, a diver wearing one of those old timey helmets having his body forced up into his own helmet by a sudden pressure change. I still don't know if that story's true. I think they did it on Mythbusters once and proved that it could actually happen. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you found that interesting. Big shout out to everyone who is supporting the channel on Patreon. Thank you very much for the support. It helps me out a great deal. Well, if you enjoyed that video, here's some more you might like too. Please check those out or maybe look out for me and your recommended in the future. Until next time, goodbye.